up, everybody? We are back on the Black and Blue podcast. I am Ken Wadike from the Free Hugs Project and... Sheriff Chris Swanson. Yes. So, um, we recently did an episode. I don't know if we titled it. Um, oh, yeah. It was titled, Please Get Home Safely. That's it. Right? And so, today's episode is How to Get Home Safely. Part two. Part two of that episode. So, they should go back and you see one. That would be really <clears throat> And helpful. watch the first one. Yes. So before we even jump into that episode, something really cool that just happened, and I don't know when we're going to air this one, but we tried to play a little trick on my mom. Yes. And I said, as soon as she answered the phone, I said, Mom, can you talk to the sheriff really quickly? She didn't know, like, which sheriff or anything, right? And I love how... Like you were like, I can't do this, can I? I, I don't want to scare her after you had spoken yeah. to her for a little bit. And then you passed it back to me. And my mom's first response was, I was thinking, what did your dad do that got you into trouble? The fact that she trusted that much that my son didn't get into trouble, yeah. right? So, so my mom knew, which was really interesting, that Kenny's going to make it home safely. That she didn't even question... It was about you. Um, yeah, it's, this isn't about Ken. And I, I could hear the nervousness in her voice. I could hear her voice even trembling a little bit. I know. But she was like, yes, officer? Yeah, <laughs> right? But, but she knew Kenny is okay. And I think part of why she knew Kenny is okay is because, as you can hear in that episode, in the Mother's Day episode that, that we did, um, my mom was always about discipline, always about respect in how you talk to your teachers, how you talk to adults, how you talk to people in positions of authority. That was always brought up to us in a way that we didn't even know at that young of an age mm -hmm. that these were steps for survival mm -hmm. in a world where the talk is, is a thing in black America. The talk was the talk before we knew it was the talk, right? A mom raising five kids, four black boys through the 80s and 90s, and plus my, my sister. And so that talk about, look, you're going to start driving and interactions that you're going to have with the police scare me. They concern me that... She's saying that they scare her. They scare her okay, for so how things are going to happen with her boy. No, we didn't so know what was out there for you. us. Yeah. So is she teaching you to be scared or no. to be aware? She's teaching us to be prepared in how you approach these situations, how you interact with figures of authority yep. to make sure that things run smooth, Got to it. make sure that you make it home safe. And so if something happened, like even this call, my mom wasn't nervous that, Kenny did something, right? Because she's like, I've brought up my son to know yeah. better, than, right? So there wouldn't be a, mom, can you talk to this sheriff? Because whatever, she's right away defaulted it's not about to Kenny. dad, right? And so when she's teaching that growing up, she's like, the things that I've seen, remember I was a boy during the Rodney King riots, right? So we watched footage of this black man just brutally assaulted in the street. Yeah. A mother's biggest fear is that, no, her son not grows a up. Biggest fear. Would you say that a black mother's biggest a fear? A black mother's biggest, totally. Yes, yes. Because my parents have never had this. They wouldn't think about that. No, no. <laughs> no that wouldn't cross right? your mind, right? But yes, a so black mother's. If I may, real quick, yep. it's important why this episode is so key to the black and blue is that we can't, when I say we, probably non black folks, because mm -hmm. there's probably people that still live. I shouldn't say that because that's pretty. Uh, uh, exclusive because I'm sure there's people that are brown and white that live in neighborhoods that their families are still kind of making sure they don't get caught up in the Absolutely. wrong thing. But I can tell you, I've never had the conversation that you need to be careful when you have an interaction with the police that you don't get killed. Right. And I think it's, it's important for us, even if it's not in our family structure that we're sensitive to people that those are real conversations. That trauma exists. And no and cops need to know that too. Yes. Yes. Notice, remember there was an episode where I talked about um, decades and centuries of trauma in black America. Right. And this is why they respond to things a certain way. Now you heard my mom's accent on that call. Right. My mom came from Africa in 79 yet still has those same concerns of look at the way Black people are treated by law enforcement when she's watching a video like that, like the Rodney King video, right? Yeah. So, so yes, to, to 
make it a more direct statement. A black mother's biggest fear is that that becomes her son on the ground during a traffic stop. That like, not oh. a black mother's biggest fear in general, but during a traffic stop, right. that's, that's a black fear. mother's fear. Is that do I lose my son to a tragedy like that? What is a black father's fear? A black father's fear in... Why would it be the same? It's not the same. I think a black father's fear in a, in a situation like that, that's interesting. Like, if I'm, if I'm thinking about my, my boy, I'm thinking about Scrunch when he gets How old older. is he right now? Lil' Kenny is 10. Okay. And I, I think my biggest concern, I guess, for him would be who he's hanging out with in the car if something like that goes down. I know how well I'm raising up my boy. But you can't control who else. Who else is there, yeah. right? And so, so I guess it's it's similar. But I think for mothers, there's that nurturing, that fear, that concern. Whereas I know as a father, I'm like, my boy is good. Mm -hmm. But I don't know who his boys are, right? Who he's hanging out with at, at that age. So I guess it's similar, yeah. but, but different. But I guess the, the through line that exists there is that black Americans are concerned about police interactions, traffic stops specifically, that are we going to get the cop that is going to escalate a situation, uh, especially if we know we are going to do whatever is in our power to not escalate this thing and just let it be the most smoothest traffic stop, right? And, and so that's why in that episode where we watched the video of the woman that was berating this officer, I was just like, oh, my goodness. Yeah, you know, I know. You're I feel the same way when I see an officer act like a ding dong on a traffic stop. I'm mm -hmm. like, oh my God. Why are you escalating this? Why? And plus, it's making it difficult for all of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I think that fear and, and concern about please make it home safe t to me, and I know we've talked about how a lot of that responsibility falls on the officers, mm -hmm. but I can't control how the officer is going to react. All I can do is control how I'm going to react and how I have brought up my child to react. You know, I know that I raise my daughters to have such class and dignity about themselves that what you're not going to do is get pulled over and start snap it off at a cop, right? Pulling me over, blah, blah, right. My daughters would never carry themselves like that because then they would still have to answer to me about yeah. why, what do you mean it, it, got it to this point, right? What were you doing to get it to that point? And so again, I expect the best out of the officer, but I can't control that. All I can control is how well did I raise up my child to be prepared for that moment if that moment ever comes. You've got an officer that's treating you a certain way, berating you a certain way. What did we talk about, right? And so some of those steps, one of the first things, and uh, Officer uh, Frunzy, Chris Frunzy, my, my boy, we... Um, I think I shared in a previous episode where he and I, we shared a stage at a college and it was so crazy because it was, um, we were brought in by, it was like the black student union. And so, um, they didn't know that Chris was coming. And so I'm on stage. And then during Q and a, oh, that's hilarious. I was like, Chris, join me on stage. And there's like 200 black people and then seven, seven. foot white guy. Chris. That's hilarious. <laughs> but they freaking loved him, right? Like yeah. they loved him. All of them were lining up to hug him and, and take pictures with him afterwards. And, um, I bet he loved that. Too, yeah. Man. Oh, he loved it. He absolutely loved it. And so as we were walking out and we're like high-fiving each other, talking about how great of an event it was, and he goes, Ken, one of the questions that came up during, um, during Q&A, I just want to give you a visual of what that looks like. And so I go, okay, cool. Um, so he goes, we were coming out, it was maybe like 10 or 11 o'clock. We're walking back to the cars. So there's like mist or fog, dew, whatever it is on the car, right? And so he goes, um, I want you to um, act like you're the officer and you're going to walk up to the car. I'm going to be the cop or I'm going to be the passenger sitting in the driver's seat, right? And so I go, okay, cool. So I go play. behind the car, right? This is like we're role playing. Yeah. Just myself yeah. and Chris, Ken and Cop in the parking lot at like 11 o'clock. And I, I walk up to the car and uh, he didn't have his window rolled down, right? So I tap the window. I said, can you roll down the window, please? And then he, uh, he rolls down uh, the window and then he goes, what's this about? And then um, I go, uh, can I see your, your driver's license and, and registration? And then right away he goes, bam. 
And I was like, what did I do wrong? And he was like, Nothing. giving me all of these like yep. steps about um, uh, the things that you all deal with. He goes, notice I couldn't see anything that was in the back seat because there was no light turned on in the yep. car. So I don't know who's in the back seat yep. back there. I, you couldn't see my hands and my hands were down here. And so as soon as I rolled down the window, I could have just been ready to blow you away. Right. Yep. And so these little steps of like turning the, the light on, turning your music down. So I know that you can hear me here with the direction and talk to the driver. Ex exactly. Yep. Right. So there's all of these steps that like, as we're role playing back and forth and I'm learning so much in this moment right. of, I'm like, that would be scary. Right here we are, and and the fact that we were two guys just in a empty parking lot friends at eleven that know each other, friends that know each other. So imagine if they're two people that have no clue. So the officer is scared, the passenger is scared. You don't know what you're walking up to. You don't know how many people are in the back seat of the car. So I I understand that anxiety in the officer, but so, I also understand that anxiety in the passenger as well. Uh, I was doing interdiction. It was at a motel and I was in full uniform in a marked car. And as I'm looking across the parking lot to where the hotel is, um, interdiction is things that people do that make us believe that they're probably transporting drugs. Right. Mm -hmm. So I see a car pull in, it's a black guy and he's, uh, he's in a, uh, like a older Cadillac and I'm just looking at him and he goes to the one side of the motel, comes back, parks, goes in, comes back out, but looks okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, probably middle age, I would say. Uh, but I run the plate and it comes back to an address like five miles from the motel. Mm -hmm. And then I look inside of the car and uh, I can see that he's got hanging clothes in the car. I'm like, what's this guy doing at a hotel, motel, five miles from his house? And he's acting all hinky, right? So he pulls out, goes left, gets on the expressway, I-75 northbound. So I get behind him and uh, pull him over. And as I'm going up, you know, you obviously have to have a legal reason to pull him over. Uh, whoever it is, and as I pulled the guy over, I had a reason. I don't recall what it was. Um, I go to the passenger side because we're on the expressway, so I always go to the passenger side. And uh, as I go up, he's got a floor shifter in his El Dorado. And I look down and I say, how you doing, sir? Um, I see your license, register, registration, proof of insurance. And he looks at me, and he looks up, he looks at me again. And I said, sir, whatever you're about to do, don't do it. No, he's staring at me like this. Mm -hmm. Now, me staring at you in a controlled setting in a studio, what did I just conjure up in the emotion inside of you? Yeah, it makes people uncomfortable. Something's about to go down. Uh -huh. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah. Put it in drive, and boom, off he went. Yeah. And that led into a chase and an arrest, and he crashed his car. Nobody got hurt. But it was at that moment where- Did he where have drugs in the car? He did not have drugs, but he had felony warrants and he had all this uh, paperwork. He was a massive fraudster. And so he had a bunch of fraud paperwork and he's ripping a bunch of people off. No dope, right? But he was a high level, well, white collar crime, you'd call it, right? But it was at that moment where this game started happening. Yeah. And I'm thinking, I, what, what are you doing right now? Because you're about to do something. Yeah. And as soon as I went from introdu introducing myself to, sir- Whatever you're about to do, don't do it. That's the same thing if you see somebody that's got a pistol and you're like, listen, and you're giving hard commands, drop the gun, drop the gun, drop the gun. The reason that is said is because you're trying to talk to people at such a high level of a sympathetic response yeah. that they're not even hearing things, just like on that traffic stop. Even role playing, I have to believe that as you're walking up, you, you were anxious. You're nervous, yeah. Like yeah. The, how how do I can't see the, in the back seat of the car? There's fog on on, on the windows. Yeah. Uh, everywhere is dark. Right. Yep. You've just got the little light of of the parking lot, and and so I, that was where I started to understand a Very little bit more about your guys's work. And this is just literally off of us coming off of this high of delivering this awesome lecture in a school, and and he was like. Let's role play that that Q and A question that the that the person just asked, where we could Good talk about frenzy, how man. both sides, cool. right, are are nervous. And he had shared with me that was where I learned. He said, um, uh, "Did you know that um, a lot of police officers, when they walk up to a car, especially in the night like this, they'll um, tap, they'll put their fingers on the back tail light for sure." And I was like, "For what?" And he said, "Because if." this person were yep. to shoot me yep. and take off yep. and just like, we've got evidence that I touched this car yeah. that my fingerprints are on DNA. the back of there. Exactly. Yeah. And I was like, I just found this out like three years ago, yep. hanging out in the parking yep. lot with Chris. Right. Yep. 
And, and so I started to learn how you all really are afraid and concerned when you walk up to a vehicle that that could cost you your life in well, that moment. Think of the odds. Just think of this. There's a, an odd for people that are in the car to be pulled over and have a negative interaction or even a fatal interaction with a police officer, right? There's odds there. Mm -hmm. If you get pulled over one time, there is a chance that it could be, right? Yeah. The odds between police officers making traffic stops is far greater mm -hmm. getting killed because we're doing so much of it. Yes. So think about the fact that there are people that will go their whole life and get pulled over two or three times or maybe called 911 one or two times, but a police officer in the in the in a single day yeah. could make five or six traffic stops could make 15 20 30 police calls yeah. every one of them is near fatal there's cops being killed just doing traffic assist for people broke down on the side of the road and then get run over by another yeah guy. hit by another car or being ambushed yeah wow i mean and so it's interesting that you're talking about that because of the anxiety that created inside of you mm -hmm. that what do you think an officer needs to do to make it home safe yeah yeah. Um, well, I know one of those steps, like he said, with um, having the fingerprints there, but I, I feel like for you guys, and again, and I will say this over and over again on this show, I do not envy the job that you guys have. I cannot do it. I think it takes a certain person to be able to do it. I am not rolling up on no cars at 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Even if I've got a weapon on me, I don't know who's in that car, I especially or if how I know, many, right? How many people are in there? If somebody's waiting in the back seat to blast me, because I really just want to get back home to my family as well. And so I, I totally get that. I understand the anxiety, the fear and concern that you all have. And even the point that you just brought up about the ratio of how many stops you guys make in a mm -hmm. day that the chances of one of those being near fatal for you, the, the, the chances Absolutely. are far greater, far greater than me just yeah. driving around in, in and, my community. And add that to a community that is high crime mm -hmm. versus a very quiet Chula Vista Suburban community. neighborhood. Yeah, yeah, we never see police around yeah. here, right? But you take that in downtown LA, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, yeah. you don't know what's going on. The chances of, of, mm -hmm. of that. And so I think on, on the flip side, what it is, and, and it's unfortunate that society like really heightens these viral videos to make everyone or make so many people in the black community feel like they're out to get us. They're not out to get us. There are incidents like that, but when we rise those things to the top and make it seem like, hey, this is what is happening to black yeah. people whenever they get pulled over, that's why you see the videos of people that are just trembling when they first get pulled over by the police. Right. Now, mind you, I, I still today get nervous, but a lot of that is just from growing up in communities where we were racially profiled by by the police, where we hear stories from friends and family members that when they got pulled over, it wasn't a good one times where I've been pulled over and it became a, an extreme border. situation. Like the one right. at the border that wasn't San Diego police though. That was more of like the, the border police. So yeah. I don't fault San Diego uh, police for that. I've actually really never had um, except for one racial profiling incident that happened here in San Diego outside of that. I've never um, really had any like now, bad interactions. I got two with things to say real quick. Mm -hmm. Number one, that one, Racial profile on that stop because you believed it was racial profiling, but we don't know what happened on the back end of that traffic stop. Yeah. That if they did it or if they did not, but it doesn't matter because perception's reality. I felt if like you I was feel, racially profiled. Yeah. Then, then my message is to the police department when they hear this, what do you need to do to alleviate the thought that they are being pulled over because of this? The totally. best you can. Some people you're just not going to convince. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, and the other thing I was going to say is you mentioned, um, um, oh my gosh, I just lost my thought on that. Yeah. Well, uh, while, while you're thinking about that, the, the racial profiling incident while I was driving. And so, and there was another one where I wasn't even driving and it happened. And I knew that this is racial profiling. The first one, um, I was coming back from college. This was my freshman year in college. And my mom had moved to a pretty rough part of San Diego in East San Diego and she was staying there and I had never lived there before. And because I was in college, I had just come into some new money. And so I had bought myself a convertible Mustang. Mm -hmm. 
and as I bought this Mustang, it still had the dealer, uh, the like the it's dealer sticker. Yeah, so it wasn't even an actual license plate. And I go in to pick up my little brother um, in school because I wanted to I surprise I say, him. Okay, cool. It. I'm glad you you got it. Um, <clears throat> but I, I wanted to surprise him, picking him up in front of mm-hmm. his friends in this new convertible Mustang that I had just bought. So I pull up to his school, and I'm waiting there. I did everything right. I had on my seatbelt. I signaled. I go into the school. And this surprise where I was trying to surprise my brother ended up being like the most embarrassing thing because now here I was waiting there to pick up my brother and he comes out and I'm sitting on the curb in front of the car no. as they're ransacking the car for absolutely no reason. Absolutely no yeah, reason. I, I and I asked them a number of times what was going on. Do you think it was, was because it was a black guy driving a nice I was in a new car in East San Diego yeah. and it just had the dealer uh, uh, yeah. thing and they just wanted to make sure that I wasn't doing something illegal. And it does make you wonder if this was like a middle-aged white guy that came into that same neighborhood, yeah. are you going to have him sitting on the curb while you're going all through the car? And it was just so embarrassing because my little brother comes out Kenny, what's going on? And I was like, man, I was trying to surprise you picking you up in this car. That breaks my heart. Yeah, man. and it just it was it was a really messed up situation, and so that was one. And I understand why because I know that you know law enforcement they're out there they're trying to do a good job, but the perception of it and, and I mean, yeah, that stuff it, it hurts. But you made a comment um, that you said uh, probably like four or five minutes ago. You said, listen, they're not out there. Uh, just to pull you over because you're black. Mm-hmm. I, I can't say that I agree with that 100% because how do you not believe that when you have Derek Chauvin's in the world? Totally. Because those guys actually give validity to the perception mm-hmm. that that's what they do. It's yeah. like when you get pulled over by a white police officer, you have great chance of dying. No, you don't. Yeah. Like, I, I, I mean, the only time there's going to be a fatal exchange is if you pull, in my world, mm-hmm. in the Swanson world of policing, mm-hmm. If you pull a weapon to kill me or someone else, there's going to be a fatal interaction. Absolutely. But I don't pull people over, no matter what, yeah. thinking I'm going to kill them. Yeah. The, the police that are out there, it, we're trained for that, obviously, because you never know. But it, it's hard for us to do a job where you have these high-profile videos and instances because you can't defend that. Mm-hmm. So what do we have to do? Do a 1,000 more traffic stops to show the community yeah. that you can trust us. Do a thousand more hours of community service. Do 10 more podcasts. And then what's going to happen? Another dandelion is going to pop up. Yeah. And they're going to they're gonna erase all that progress that law enforcement's done throughout the country. I, I completely agree. And, and I think, you know, even back to like what you were saying about uh, racial profiling, it's like it's it's hard to erase that or the thought or assumption that was I pulled over because... I was a black man in a nice car. Mm-hmm. And, and it's unfortunate that, that that's still a concern in society, right? Like I know that if I was cruising through East San Diego for obeying, obeying every single traffic law, but I was in Adam's Porsche, forget about it. I know I'm not coming out of there without getting pulled over. Hands down. I don't, like a thousand percent. I'm getting rolled on by the police easily right because they would be like how does he have that car that is racial profiling to the t wondering how do i have that car how do you know i'm not a successful business person how do you know i'm not a successful investor how do you know i like there's so many things that i could do as opposed to well he's a black dude in a an expensive or exotic sports car he must be up to no good right and so in our community we know that's a thing Right. Like that's just how we feel. And so no matter how many police may say, I didn't pull you over because you were black. No, nah, you probably did. Right. Because that's like you combined my race with the car and the neighborhood that I was in. So let me. So let's just say this. So for police out there, if you are pulling somebody over, please give a, nice a reason. Car, a real give a reason, reason right out of the please. gate. When you walk up. Hi, doing, Mr. Wadake. Yep. My name is Deputy Swanson and you were doing 15 over. Uh, in a 45, I'm here to talk to you about that. Give yeah. me lights. Right out of the gate, we are so tight to the vest about first getting the information. Yeah. I, I think we need to do a much better job explaining why. And if you don't have I a reason, then don't create a problem for the rest of us because I understand why. Trust me, I understand interdiction. I understand making sure that the communities are safe, but but have a justified reason. Yeah. And And you know what? People can probably accept that easier even though they don't like it mm-hmm. they can accept it easier and than I having no reason wrong. Yeah. exactly like in the example you were given earlier and you said 
the guy was acting erratic around this this Cadillac, yeah. right? So there's additional reasons other than he was a black dude in a Cadillac. 100%. Because, right? But that that's what he would feel, and then yeah. he turned out to be a criminal, right? Yep. And, but the times that it happened to me, I was not a criminal, and I was never given an right. explanation. Right. Pulling up in front of my little brother's school, and they're assuming that I'm up to no good because I'm, I'm in this car. And so after they're done with their whole search and, and everything, because I didn't have insurance yet on the car because I had just bought it. And back then this was 90 something to where you can get your insurance later. They towed the freaking car. No. Towed the car. So I had to go and get insurance oh online. Gosh. Yes. So I'm oh like, why gosh. are we escalating so this to this point? they didn't believe your story. They didn't believe any of it, right? I'm like, look, I'm a they scholarship said, athlete. Hey, listen, man, just park it here. Even if you call my mom, she so, could come and come gosh. and get it. Right. And so they're like, you don't have all the paper. I'm like, I just bought the car and they're not. Ha- I'm like, look, I'm a scholarship you know I mean? athlete. Oh and you can call my coach. Right. Yep. Like I just came into yep. a good amount of money. This is my first vehicle. Towed the car. You, I have, had the, to go. you have all the documentation there. Yep. You're picking up your brother at school. Listen, man. There was I, no drugs, no I, I, nothing you know in the car. I'm having flashbacks of people that I used to work with that I don't work with anymore because I was a deputy. Remember, I told you there's people in my agency that they wouldn't they wouldn't even survive in the culture that we have now because we've changed everything, right? And they would find it successful to tow cars all the time. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, if someone's suspended because of a circumstance that they couldn't control or they just couldn't get out of the hole, yeah. then why? compound that Made by towing their car when you're in a parking lot or the friend can drive it yeah but you just want to be a a jerk and, and, and tow take the their car, car from them and when a tow company comes you know what they do a police tow not a normal tow so it's double the price then it's there on a police tow which is double the storage fee yeah. and let's just say you can't get there for three days now you've got a three four hundred dollar tow bill yeah. on top of the ticket they they probably wrote you yeah. so now you're always trying to it's just you know what it drives me nuts because you've got to use good discernment to say, listen, you can still, you know, hold people accountable without adding punitive damage to people Absolutely. and just burying them. Especially, especially when you're in college. Especially if you know the background, yeah. you know, if the person was a total disrespectful person and, yeah. and they just asked for it, then that's on you. Yeah. But we have enough intelligence and enough street interview skills that we could determine, you know what, this guy's telling the truth. He's got paperwork. Yeah. He's got nothing in his car. He's picking up his little brother, man. But to tow your car? Yeah. I, seriously. Took, took the car. Oh my um, gosh. In look, the school parking lot. I was in the roundabout to pick up my brother as they came into the roundabout and just pulled up behind me and then asked for my and driver's license. if it license. wasn't for your personality, you would have a justified reason to not like police. Yeah, for the rest of your life, if you uh, aren't prob- the prob- probably not the rest of my life, but uh, because that that was like one extreme yeah. moment like that where I was just like, these guys really had it out for me for no reason because there were there were those extra steps they were taking, going in the glove box and going in the trunk. Like, dang, you guys are really looking for something, huh? And and I'm like, I. I go to Cal State University, San Marcos. I'm just down here to pick up my brother. I want to surprise him that. But let's just say this. this. Let's just say it's fast forward. They could have easily have said, you know what? That makes sense. Hey, bro, listen, you can't in the streets of California drive a vehicle without proof of insurance. Mm -hmm. Just because if you get an accident, blah, blah, blah. So why don't you just park it here and just get your Call your mom, somebody, go get it, and then come back. That's right. I mean, oh my gosh. And so so there's situations like that where I knew that. As afraid as I was in in that moment, and mind you, at that point, I'm probably um, maybe 18, 19 years old, still terrified of the police because of things that I've seen, things that I've heard and experienced. But when there is a moment like that, that is in very obvious racial profiling interaction, that it's stuck with me for life, right? Here I am 20 plus years later that I remember yeah, like it was every yesterday. single detail know, in that moment I because I knew that I was being treated unjustly for being a black guy in a nice car in the wrong neighborhood, right? And so those sort of things, when we talk about making it home safely, some of the steps that I took in being respectful and giving them all of the documentation that I, that I had, I said, you could call the dealership, know that I just bought no. this car a few days ago. They're like, I'm still trying to figure out the insurance thing. It's my, my first car, right? The car that I had before that when I was in high school, I paid 500 bucks for. I was riding dirty, no big deal, right? I was a kid. But now I'm in college and I'm trying to do things right. You didn't have to tow the car. I know, man. And so when you're in those racial profiling moments, I still took every step necessary to make it home safely. And instead, I'm sitting on the curb with my brother. Okay. Embarrassing. So, p- 
police sometimes can accelerate or pour fuel on a fire by how we deal with people. Yeah. In any police interaction, when 911 is called, there is a consent that is given to law enforcement to take over the scene. Yeah. You cannot and you don't have to let anybody in your house because you own your house, right? Mm-hmm. But you call 911, you've already given consent that Got we're it. coming in. Got it. Police can stop anybody at any time for a traffic violation. They can pull over a Supreme Court justice. They can pull over a four-star general and stop what they're doing. I say that because police wield a mighty sword. Yeah. We need to remember every day that if we want to make it home safe, you can't control what you can't control, but you can control how you handle yourself in your day-to-day business. Yeah. And as we've said many times, we want to be home. We, we want to make it uh, alive. And so we have to continue tactically, professionally, personally, be on our best game. Yeah. I've said uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I was on an interview and I said, there's about 800,000 police officers in the United States. We need 800,000 best police officers Absolutely. ever. Absolutely. Like we can never go to the time that you just said right now, back in the nineties, yeah. back to those days where you're just nitpicking somebody mm-hmm. because now all you're doing is you're adding, you know, the Bible says, don't uh, exacerbate your child mm-hmm. by, by just needling over and over, you yeah. know, and ever nobody wants that. Yeah. I don't even want that. Right. That's how you make it home. That's one of the ways you make it home yeah. safe. We talked about mind, body, and spirit in one episode. We talk about, you know, tactically uh, preparing yourself and, and having all the gear. But most of the stuff that we deal with, it can be dealt with in a very professional way. Yeah. That's why I'm saying don't don't think you're a great cop if you write 30 tickets on a shift. Mm-hmm. You're a great cop if you taught 30 people how to change their behavior. Yeah. And, and, and if you use good discretion and maybe somebody deserves a ticket, but most of them don't, then that's that's good. You don't get a, a free toaster by messing with people right. on a day-to-day basis. I don't even want you in this field. Yeah. If you're a good cop, protect the neighborhoods, and maybe you do find somebody's breaking into houses, or you do a good case, and you, you found DNA, and you got a conviction, or you got warrants for somebody in human trafficking, those are all... But when you talk about the the modern day human uh, interaction with police, it has changed even from the '90s to the mid 2000s yeah. up until last year. Absolutely. So I, I think for me, my my closing thoughts, and and I know that you know people are going to expect that. Well, if the responsibility is on the officers, et cetera, but that that's a two way street, two way, right? Absolutely. And so there's a video of this black father who is um, training his son on how to. Um, interact in a traffic stop to make sure that he makes it home safely. Um, But I know for me, some of the things that I'm already teaching my children, um, even before the role playing that I did with Chris, but things that I learned from that moment with, with Chris. um, But I know that beforehand for me, what I would do is as soon as I see even the sirens or recognize that I'm being pulled over, I um, grab my driver's license and registration and put it on the dash so that I don't have to reach for it when when it's asked for. Um, And with that on the dash, before the officer even comes up to the car, I know that if if he's uncomfortable or nervous and I'm uncomfortable and nervous, I don't want to be like jittery as I'm going to the glove box and all of that. It's already right there on the dash. When he walks up, my music is down so I can hear what's being said. My window is rolled down. I even rolled down after that Chris role play thing. I rolled down the back window because I want to put that officer at ease to know, yo, I'm not a threat to you. So don't escalate this thing because I just want to make it home safe. Right. So my back window is down. Even if it's freezing cold, there's been times I've been driving in certain states to go and do a lecture somewhere. And I'm like, I don't even know how the cops roll in this city or state. So it'll Especially be freezing. A black guy. Yeah, totally. I'm a yep. black dude in just some random neighborhood where I'm yep. trying to get to this college yep. to give a lecture. And I'm like, what I don't need is my car getting towed when I'm supposed to be on right. stage in 20 minutes. And so both windows are down. Even if it's snowing out, the back windows are so down. So when an officer rolls up on a car and sees that happen, give them a little bit more discretion. Give them a little bit more grace and mercy. If they're trying to do their part, yep. white, black, male, female, it doesn't matter. You have to person on the stop is trying to do their part to make it home safe don't be a jerk yeah don't escalate it please because i'm already scared and trying to put you at ease yeah you can still be tactically sound and still you know what i respect that that's what it comes down to and and that happens often how many times you've been pulled over in life uh, i can't even remember man because again racial profiling it's it's a real 
thing, right? It, like as much as you may okay. be able to speak on behalf of you and, and your officers that may not do that, yeah. it doesn't change how many times this. it happens to it. us to where I'm like, I know for a fact because I was not given a legitimate yep. reason as to why I was stopped. And a lot of times those steps that I take, usually, so one of the more um, recent times, you know what? And, and this one, it was my fault. Just uh, two months ago, Sabrina and I, we were pulling up to the studio here. The light right there where you turn to yeah. uh, come to the Costco. So you can make a right turn coming from our, our house. And I didn't know that there's a, a cop who waits right at the, across from the Costco. And Why does he wait there? Uh, because people don't um, stop before making the right turn, right? See, that bugs me. Why would you... I don't know, but he was posted up there, right? Uh, and unless so, there's problems, man. Don't but I was at I was at fault, right? Because I, I didn't know. I didn't stop. And I guess here's why it matters: the light coming this way is such a busy light from people coming into Costco right. that if you don't stop before making that right. turn, you can wreck into one okay, of these see, cars. Now, police side, if he was or she being assigned there because we've had multiple wrecks and that's that probably that's legit. Yes. If you're assigned there because you want to pull over soccer moms going to Costco, yeah, don't no, do that's that. That's not cool. Yeah. See the difference? Yeah. Exactly. Why are, why are you there? Mm -hmm. And if it's for good reason, keep doing it. But it's if it's to nitpick society yeah. and community, all you're doing is adding salt to the wound. You know why I knew that was the reason? And he was a white officer, but he told me that. Exactly. He explained himself. Duh, right? yes. Because so as as I, I got there. And because Good I'm so him. used to coming here because this is my office, right? So I'm just so used to making that yeah. turn. What were you driving? I was in, um, uh, I think I was in our Suburban. Okay. So it was okay. a big, big truck, yep. right? And I make that turn. And so as I make the turn, then it was a motorcycle cop. And I see the lights come on. And then I was like, I had told Sabrina, I said, we're getting pulled over. But you know what was strange about it? I was actually just chill because I knew I didn't stop at yeah. that light, right? Yeah. And so as he, he pulls me over... And um, he came up, he asked for the driver's license registration. Um, so my hands are on the steering wheel. Yep. All my stuff is up on the dash. Um, I said, do you mind if I grab it? It's, it's right there on the dash. And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. He goes, do you know why I stopped you? And then I said, my bad, man. I know I didn't stop at that, um, at that light over there. And then he goes, there are so many people that don't recognize how busy it is, everyone coming into Costco to, to get um, gas yeah. over here, especially during the pandemic, how busy Costco has been. And so that is a really congested area. So if you don't stop and you didn't notice that turn yeah. that you can wreck. And so I was like, dude, I totally understand. My office is right over here and I can see how that would be a normal thing. And, um, and he just handed me my stuff back. Didn't even go back to the car yeah. and, and run it. Um, and, and he goes, just do me a favor. Make sure you stop there for your own safety. See, that's a teaching future. moment, man. You don't it. need to do a ticket for that. He didn't take it extra or anything. And it's, like, that was we it. We talk about this relationship thing. That's how it was supposed to work. Totally. On both sides. Yes. Yes. You know, the first time I ever heard that black fathers or mothers, but this was happened to be a black father, talk to their kids about how to handle themselves in a traffic stop so they can make a home safe. You know, when the, when the first time I heard of that mm. last summer, really last summer, first time ever. Wow. Bishop Roberson. I come up to I do a podcast at his church. It was about two months after the march, and and uh, you know everybody was just pulling in, wanting to get in front. And I've known Bishop for a long time, mm -hmm. and uh, it, he's talking, and you know he's obviously on that side of the room, and I'm over here, and uh, he mentions this, and I said, "Whoa, whoa, Bishop, what did you just say again?" Yeah, he said, "Yeah." He goes, "I've talked to my sons that are like 18 and 19 that when they get pulled over, this is how you act so you don't get shot and killed." I'm like, "Why would you do?" And I say that because I don't think there's a lot of people that realize yeah, that that's a, a especially a for the black community. The black hole, Everybody's household. nervous. I've told you that. I'm nervous when I get pulled over. Yeah. But when you add on top of that, the fact that the race thing. Yes. Yeah, it, be sensitive to that. Totally. Would you act the same if it was a black officer that pulled you over? Yes, because I think it's it's the um, figure of authority. I don't think it's um, it has surpassed being just about race and more about the job. Um, it's, I don't know. It's, it's really interesting. I like, I feel like sometimes when you put people in positions of power, uh, when they're in that position of leadership or in positions of power, there's a tendency to look at potential suspects, mm -hmm. right? And even if that potential suspect is the same skin color as yours, I don't even think, sometimes when black officers don't realize that they too are racially profiling 
sometimes their own in their own communities. And because of the way I reason, I try to understand that even if you are a black officer in, let's say, a pretty rough neighborhood, if so many of the drug stops and traffic stops and things are people of color that you're pulling over, mm-hmm. it's unfortunate that that could start to mess with the programming in a person's head to yeah. feel like, oh, that 40-year-old white guy who drove by, statistically, it's not usually yeah, him. Exactly. But what if it was this time, right. right? And so your focus is on me because I'm in a convertible with you know my hair a certain way. Yeah that you would rather go and pull me over assuming that I've got something wrong. Goes not even real Exactly, right? Yeah. Not even realizing yeah. that dude just drove by and just yeah. kidnapped a kid out of the hood to go sexually traffic that kid, and I'm just a kid coming yeah. home from college, right? Yeah. And so, so I think over time it became less about watch out for white officers to where, and you can ask a lot of black people this, it's not just a white policing thing, it's a policing Policing, thing, right? right? And so when we feel like we're being racially profiled, we could be racially profiled by a black officer as well because the job has has sometimes in, in some ways, again, if you keep on seeing that, it could corrupt your views even in your own community. And I know we said our final thoughts like 10 minutes ago, but I would say this, I would ask then that the people in the community side don't, it's not racial profile, but professionally profile law enforcement. Yeah. Like don't, and we've said this before, don't think that my interaction with you Mm -hmm. is going to be the same as it was with the person who pulled you over last time. My dad, former Detroit cop would say this, you are leaving an impression good or bad to the person for the next cop to deal with. Yeah. Like, what do I want that interaction to be? That's a big deal. Yeah. Do you have any final thoughts on making a home safe? No. I, well, I guess um, it, just some of those steps. I, I want to reiterate some of those steps, especially for black families, black mothers, black fathers that do still have these concerns, especially about racially profiling or um, uh, just how to teach your kids to be better during traffic stops. And um, I, I think if, if I'm even... Uh, using some of the steps from the role playing with Chris, I know how important it is for um, everyone to feel comfortable during that stop, for your child to feel comfortable and for that officer to feel comfortable. And so when we can teach our kids, hey, just turn down the music, even if it's just for a little bit so you can hear those commands, Um, make sure that their hands are on the steering wheel. Uh, make sure that when you know you're being pulled over that you do have easy access to your driver's license and registration so you don't have to reach through cracks or crevices that are going to make this officer nervous for you to go in and and grab those things. Um, When you're getting pulled over, if you're on a dark and and scary road, um, you don't necessarily have to stop right at at that stop. If you're like, I want to pull over right under this street light to make sure that there's some visibility here. That these are all things that are, are important to us because I'm like, I don't want to stop right down there where there's no additional light or anything. Or if there's like a parking lot right there with some lights on, I want to at least get to there or get where there are some other people so that there's accountability. These are the type of things that we mm-hmm. tell our kids that, hey, if you, you you're not... Um, in a high speed chase or running away from the cops. If you're like, no, I just need to get to that light right there. Or I just need to get to that gas station parking lot right there where there's other people so that there's some accountability and potential cameras in in that thing. So these are all things that we know in the black community that just those extra little steps that can help keep us safe. Um, and, And so that's, that's my final thought as people are teaching their kids that, Hey, there are still these issues in the country. And I know in the next episode, you're going to talk about steps that uh, officers can take in those interactions so that, again, it puts everybody at ease. I don't think it's it's, uh, the officer's job to say, I must put this black person at ease because I don't know why they're afraid of me. But I think just collectively, we should all, just as human beings, say we should all chill a little bit. Can we all just like chill out? And and whatever steps it takes for us to do that, Let's get there. So that's my final thoughts. And I would say, uh, because we're kind of focusing on traffic stops, make it a good stop. Yeah. Explain the stop. That's important. But if you want to make it home safe, then create an environment that gives you the greatest odds to be safe. Absolutely. And when you remove those odds, then both people or individuals pay a price. Yeah. Um, We have a job that it is very uh, likely that the risk is much greater than any other profession, not to make it home safe. Yeah. We're recording this episode in um, May of 2021, and 119 police officers have already been killed this year alone. 119. Wow. Um, ambush, 
COVID, accidents, drownings. Yeah. So we know we live in a field that you can give your life. Mm -hmm. um, but that still doesn't give us um, a pass to create situations where it's going to put you or other people at risk. So limit your risk by doing the best you very you, you can. And uh, ultimately, we know to pay the ultimate price. Yeah. But uh, make it home safe. I don't care if you're white, black, male, female, police, non-police. Do what you got to do to make it home safe. Absolutely. Cool. Well, See you next time.